The Trump indictment continues to stall. Is it delayed or is it dead? We don't know. But people are asking if Alvin Bragg, the district attorney, is running scared. Where is he? We don't even hear from him. And the grand jury seems like it has been delayed and delayed and delayed. Meanwhile, if you check the New York Manhattan district attorney's office, you'll see here this morning, oh, they're doing a learning collaborative. That's very nice is what they're posting on Twitter. You see all these people here, which is working on housing for formerly incarcerated individuals, which I support, which is neat. But we're also asking Alvin, the whole country seems like it's kind of paused until you decide what to do on this thing. So can we expect an indictment anytime soon? Well, NBC News from New York says probably not. Planned grand jury meeting on Wednesday was called off abruptly. It's still not clear why. And while the grand jury was supposed to reconvene today, doesn't sound like it was about anything related to Trump. Unclear what the grand jury was going to discuss today, Thursday, if it wasn't Trump. Sources say the situation remains fluid, but as of 10 a.m. this morning, it was looking like the grand jury might not meet on Trump matters until Monday <gasps> at the earliest. Uh-oh, Monday at the earliest. So that means not even going to get an indictment on Friday. Bragg's office declined to comment. So we can't talk about grand jury matters. Now, these are always shout shrouded in secrecy, as they say. The world continues to wait. Why, though, did this all suddenly get delayed? It seemed like this was a pretty foregone conclusion. And people are turning around and saying, Trump elevated this. He blew this whole thing out of proportion. It's his fault. This was never going to come anyways. And I don't believe that for a minute. They were setting up barricades that the FBI were you know, stretching out. They were doing their hamstring stretches, getting ready to hurdle over during the next insurrection. And they were bracing for impact, right? It seemed like they were elevating this. They were leaking it all over the media. A bunch of different news sources got wind of it. And then suddenly off the rails. What happened? Could it be the fact that Robert Costello, who we've talked about a lot here, came out and told the truth? Maybe. One person seems to think that might be the case, including Alina Abba. And so because she is such an insightful commentator and she has very, very keen legal knowledge, we're going to listen to her and see what she has to say about this most recent development. What's going on? with these delays in the Trump grand jury indictment. Inside Alvin Bragg's office, what's happening with this case? Well, my guess is, um, obviously, you know, this isn't my case. I'm not a criminal attorney, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to read the news and figure out what's going on here. I would assume that the grand jurors are getting frustrated, feeling perhaps like they're being lied to yeah. and that they're not getting a full picture of what is going on, which is very typical for a corrupt system of justice that is, has Trump derangement syndrome, which is exactly what is going on here. Exactly right. Lots of TDS in the house. And I think she's right about that. It, you don't really need to be a rocket scientist. They sounded like they were very excited about prosecuting him. They were all giddy and geared up over the CNN. It's like, oh, yeah, the walls are closing in. Rah. Mika and Joe Brzezinski, they were you know, throwing cocktail parties over there at MSNBC. And so we turn our attention now to what else could have been deviating a lot of the enthusiasm to prosecute Trump so quickly. Well, people are digging into this. And Paul Sperry, who is on Twitter, at Paul Sperry underscore, he caught this one. He says, new, last March, Alvin Bragg's wife, Jamila, retweeted a report. Uh-oh. For those of you who are not on Twitter, you got to be very careful with those retweets. Sometimes they can be illegal and bust you big time, like this one. And she, this is what she wrote. Finally, this is a retweet. Now, I, mean, I retweet a bunch of stuff. and doesn't mean I always endorse everything, but this one's curious. And keep in mind that the author of the retweet is not the wife, but she is retweeting it. <laughs> and she says, so the wife's sitting there and she's like, oh gosh, I'm so bored. What a long day. Boring, boring, boring. She's on Twitter. Boring, boring. Ooh, I like this one. Retweet. Here's what it said. Finally, a bit of good news in the Manhattan DA criminal case against Donald Trump. What? The story claimed that her husband has Trump nailed on felonies. Oh, man. Jamila has since locked her Twitter account. Oh, bummer. So we're asking ourselves, 
what is Jamila doing with the, over there retweeting this stuff? And that's kind of a condescending retweet, isn't it? Like if that's your wife and your wife's, she's kind of dunking on him on Twitter. Is she not? Finally, a bit of good news. She's like, oh gosh, I hope he sees this retweet. You know, she retweets it. Maybe he'll see it. Because they're probably having fights about this stuff at the dinner table at home. <laughs> She's upset about it. Are you going to do anything? You know, you never take the trash out here. You never help out. You used to take me out to dinner every night. And now it's only five nights a week. Are you going to prosecute him or not? I feel like we don't even talk anymore. And then so finally she's scrolling around, scrolling around and she sees it. She's like, oh, perfect. And so his wife is kind of dunking on him out there. Wonder if he saw that. So has Trump nailed on the felonies and she has since locked her Twitter account. Nobody wants to see that. She kind of hid that one under the covers. But then over here, <laughs> this one from Joey Perez on Twitter, he got the screenshot. And so nothing is deleted. Internet lives forever. Here at Palmer Report is the report. This is what she actually retweeted. There's the retweet. Finally, a bit of good news in the Manhattan DA case against Donald Trump. She's like, yeah, finally, my idiot husband's been so lazy. Finally, retweet it. Finally. <laughs> and so Joey Perez got it. And she goes, that's weird. It, oh, these people are partisan hacks. You're not kidding. Yeah, it's totally true. They're all busted. And maybe the pressure is coming down to bear upon them. And it may just be, you know, that they're sort of being exposed as partisan hacks. It could also be that the facts of their case are horrible and they're finally being called to light. One thing that came out very recently was this letter. Cohen sent a letter via his lawyer in a highly confidential memo over to the Federal Election Commission. And let's take a look at what this one looks like because this seems to exonerate Trump completely. Remember the base layer claim against Donald Trump is that he paid or he directed to be paid Stormy Daniels. He was involved in falsifying business records. It was for one purpose. He misclassified it illegal. He did it with the intentionality of covering up or concealing a crime. And that elevates it from a misdemeanor into a felony and all these things. But if Trump wasn't involved in that, he doesn't check the boxes that justify any criminal charges. And that seems like it is lacking in this case. And the prosecutor, District Attorney Bragg and his wife, Jamila, they should evidently know this stuff because they are, of course, he is at least the prosecutor. So this is the letter that was drafted back several years ago, February 8th, 2018, highly confidential. It is from an attorney at law called Stephen Ryan's office, signed by Stephen Ryan himself. And look who wrote that there. Counsel for Michael Cohen, Stephen M. Ryan, sincerely yours, writes the following. Uh, dear Federal Election Commission, attention, Crystal, dear Mr. Jordan, I'm writing on behalf of my client, Michael Cohen, in response to your letter. In a private transaction before the election, Mr. Cohen used his own personal funds to facilitate a payment of 130 grand to Stephanie Clifford Stormy. Neither the Trump organization nor the Trump campaign was a party to the transaction with Clifford and neither reimbursed Mr. Cohen for the payment directly or indirectly. Contrary to the allegations in the complaint, which are entirely speculative, neither Mr. Cohen nor essential consultants made any in-kind contributions for Trump nor any other presidential campaign committee. Mr. Cohen has not been a government em employee at any moment, and the payment in question does not constitute a campaign contribution or an expenditure, and therefore, you, the FEC, you lack jurisdiction over this matter in the first place. The complaints have not and cannot present evidence to the contrary. Accordingly, the complaint could be, should be dismissed. Thank you. So now Cohen is reversing that statement. He's, oh no, Trump did direct me and Trump did reimburse me or whatever it is he's claiming. We don't even know exactly because he's running his mouth off to the grand jurors and he changes his story all the time. The dude is a convicted perjurer. So who knows what he's even saying now? It's hard to even speculate on his statements because he's so all over the place. Forgets he even signed a conflict, a, a, a waiver of attorney-client privilege as we spoke about yesterday. So that's just the initial letter and pay close attention to this date, February 8th, 2018. So this seems like it's kind of an initial letter. You know, we follow letters through a sequence over a timeline here regularly. And this one was on the 8th of February, 2018, but that wasn't the end of it. 
They supported that. FEC sends a complaint. They say, whoa, we got a complaint? First of all, this was a private transaction. You don't even have jurisdiction over this. So your complaint should be dismissed. Don't even get the heck out of here, right? What are you doing? Get, get out of here. But the FEC probably said, uh, no, how about no? We do have jurisdiction. We are the FEC. We hate Donald Trump. And at this moment, Michael Cohen is still sort of more closely aligned with him. And so we're going to come back and hit you harder. But the, the attorneys say, wait a minute, we are so assured of our position that this is not a Michael Cohen or this is not a Donald Trump involved transaction that we are going to be submitting a supplemental memo that you guys at the FEC can go through. Here's what it says. And look, this was received digitally signed on April 9th. So just a couple months after the original date. And you see here, April 6th looks like when it was drafted. So the same people. Stephen Ryan, another lawyer, right, same lawyer for Michael Cohen, says the following. It's, a, it's an addendum. He's supplementing the original claim. And he is, he's, look, this is a lot more argumentative, right? He's citing authority and he's explaining the whole thing. And this is some highlights from this. He says, here's our response. Contrary to the allegations from you guys, the payment was private, was not political, was not made for the purpose of influencing the election, would have been made irrespective of Trump's candidacy. Had nothing to do with it. Accordingly, don't exert your resources on us. The payment was not bold italicized, not made in connection with Mr. Trump's campaign. Mr. Cohen has never been an agent or an employee of the Trump campaign. The payment was not made for the influ purpose of influencing the election and so on. Goes through the laws, explains the FEC rules back to them and g gives us some old compare and contrast cases. They say this is a private transaction, was not for the campaign and so on. Therefore, why don't you dismiss the complaint and close these matters? done on behalf of Michael Cohen, signed and submitted back in April 2018. Now they're changing their story. It's all turning around. Isn't that interesting and convenient? Curious. So it's not just that. Cohen, obviously a liar. Obviously his attorneys are scratching their heads right now going, what the heck is our, what the heck is he saying? What is he changing? You know, this is all documented and it's now coming out. That might be why this case is not moving forward as well. But if that's true, why would Alvin Bragg bring a case this far without knowing this basic stuff? I mean, this stuff has been around since 2018. Everybody else knew it. Everybody else declined prosecution on this. So if he is sort of overlooking these major flaws in the case and still deciding that I'm going to move forward on this anyways, how is that not prosecutorial misconduct? How is that not crossing that threshold from investigating a potential crime and doing justice and turning it into a political campaign of harassment via the state government? We'll see. Now, there's more every day. It just continues to come out. Donald Trump posted this on True Social without any comment, just a link over to TMZ. And if you go over to the TMZ article, the TMZ article will actually do a little signature comparison and they'll say, yeah, we think this is the same person. And they'll give you the details on that. But he posted that on True Social today. And this was a letter from Stormy Daniel Daniels showing that there was no affair. What on earth? Here's what it says. To whom it may concern. Actually, let's pull this up. I think I have this here. Here. To whom this may concern. The official statement of Stormy Daniels, January 30th, 2018, before the Cohen letter to the FEC. Stormy says, To whom it may concern, uh, over the past few weeks, I have been asked countless times, countless times, to comment on reports of an alleged relationship I had with Donald Trump many, many, many years ago. The fact of the matter is that each party to this alleged affair denied its existence in 2006. 2011, uh oh, typo there. She was typing a little fast, two zeros. 2016, 2017, and now again in 2018. I am not denying this affair because I was paid, quote, hush money, as has been reported in overseas owned tabloids. I am denying this affair because it never happened. Oh, 
I will have no further comment on this matter. Please feel free to check me out on Instagram. Yeah, gosh, at the Stormy Daniels, if you're so inclined. Be very careful when you go over there. Thank you. Stormy Daniels. Oh, man, doesn't that suck if you're a Democrat prosecutor called Alvin Bragg? That sucks, man. Bummer. Wow. Man, that like totally destroys your case, doesn't it, Alvy? Pretty terrible. All right, well, that stinks. So uh, probably won't change anything. They'll continue to prosecute him because what do they care about the truth or reality? But look, you've got two people on both sides of the transaction now uh, poking holes in it every which way. Cohen and his lawyers and multiple of them, we've got actual documentary evidence of this, saying that the transaction was conducted by Michael Cohen. We've got Robert Costello, another advisor. We spent some time on that yesterday, listening to him tell us the same thing. That Costello said, Cohen orchestrated the whole thing never at the behest of Trump. On the other side of the transaction, Stormy Daniels says, we never even slept together. So the whole thing is just ridiculous. Now, doesn't that sort of eliminate a lot of the motive, a lot of the intent, a lot of the mens rea for Trump? I mean, my gosh, if there wasn't even an affair in the first place, why are they paying their, their $130,000? And if Trump didn't, you know, did, did he owe her some other consulting fees or something? The story just deflates day by day by day. And Alvin Bragg is still nowhere to be seen. Now, we do hear a little bit from him because he is upset about Congress, not about his failing prosecutor's office. U.S. Congress and the Oversight and Judiciary Committees have been upset with a lot of what they're seeing take place around the country, and they're responding with many letters. One of those letters went over to Alvin Bragg. Alvin Bragg, the DA, has been prosecuting Donald Trump, and one of the things that we've been asking ourselves is about jurisdiction and who has authority to prosecute Trump and how do these things work? If it's a misdemeanor case, they run out with a statute of limitations. If they turn it into a felony, it might uh, extend the statute of limitations. We've got other different concepts between state crimes and federal crimes. We've got Georgia prosecution, New York prosecution, special counsel prosecution from the U.S. Department of Justice. A lot of complex overlaps. If you're Kamala Harris and you're Venn diagramming any of this, you're like, oh, this is crazy. She's probably cackling on the school bus with USB ports. But here is Jim Jordan explaining what he believes the jurisdiction is for Congress to send a letter over to the DA's office demanding to know more. With, with you know, elected officials here in Congress, there's been reports in the news that Democrats have been working with Bragg, pushing Bragg, helping Bragg in this, in this direction. So that's something that we think is important to understand, not to mention the federal money and this interesting issue. Did this, this looks like it sprang out of the special counsel's investigation, the Mueller investigation. So we want to examine it for that reason as well. We may need to change the special counsel statute at some point, who knows? But that's, I think, an important question we're asking also. We'll see what Mr. Bragg says. He's supposed to get back with us by tomorrow, uh, by tomorrow morning. And he did. We did get a letter back from Alvin Bragg. But I had some questions about jurisdiction as well. I wanted to know what Congress thought their authority was. And you saw a couple of those things were pointed out by Jim Jordan. He mentioned special counsel jurisdiction, same type of argument that we heard from a lot of the J6 committee. They said, well, we, you know, we might have to pass legislation that talks about the transition of power. And so this gives us authority to go get Sebastian Gorka, for example, you know, his text messages or whatever. So we have these continual debates, but we're asking if the Republicans are going to go sort of as far as the Democrats are. And it looks like they are using this tool to go and get answers. Now, the one question I always had was about election interference. I mean, Trump is the number one candidate for the Republican Party. Whether you like that or not, it seems to be the reality. DeSantis looked like he was coming up and he's sort of being knocked back down a little bit. And if that holds, you have the prosecution of a former president, but also the lead candidate for the next election. And as the Mexican president, AMLO, we heard from yesterday, he was mocking this openly, saying they tried to prosecute me to keep me off the ballot. And what they're doing there is just as reprehensible. So then when you juxtapose that with all of the other problems of the case that we just talked about with Cohen and all of the other factual inaccuracies, maybe even the idea that there wasn't even an affair, when it all comes together, 
The totality makes it feel like it's political and it is election interference. And if that was good enough for Liz Cheney and Kinzinger, it should be good enough for the Republicans. But that was Jordan. Now, Alvin Bragg did respond back over to Congress, and I wanted to run through that and see what he had to say about this. Did I pull this up? Don't know if I mark if I sharpied this one up for us. So let's just get at it right now. Pull the red pen out, give it a little girth, and get right to it. Alvin Bragg, district attorney from New York, sent this letter back over to Congress on March 23rd. He said, hey, Jim Jordan and James Comer, I've got a message for you. He writes, hey, Congress, punks. The district attorney of New York is investigating allegations that Donald Trump violated our law. The investigation of one of thousands conducted by our office protecting New York. And I, I can't and I can't stand when they do this. They say that this is like the same thing as other things. They did this when they were raiding Mar-a-Lago. They said, what are you talking about? The FBI investigates all sorts of people. And you say, oh, really? Former presidents? How many of those are they investigating right now? It's not the same, but they try to they try to do this thing where they're just like Merrick Garland. We speak through our filings. You know, OK, well, your filings are against a former president. Can you comment on that? Because there's not a lot of precedent for this. The investigation has been conducted consistently with our highest of standards. They say that we pledge that we would publicly state at the conclusion of our investigation whether we would be bringing charges, and if they are brought, it will be because of the law and the faithful execution of our office. I, I, I told you, they talk like this all the time. The prosecutors are the weirdest people. And they, it's hard to even read it because it's so full of pomp and rhetorical flourish. It's, it's almost meaningless. They say, now we get to something that means something. Your letter dated March 20th, in contrast, they say, Jim, is an unprecedented inquiry into a pending local prosecution. The letter only came after Donald Trump created, listen, a false expectation that he would be arrested the next day and his lawyers reportedly urged you to intervene. He's citing the New York Times. Neither fact is a legitimate basis for a congressional inquiry, he says. Well, there were leaks from a bunch of different uh, news entities. They got their sources that said this was happening. Your office didn't dispute that at the time. You guys, in fact, Alvin, were setting up barricades that the FBI was getting ready to leap over. So that's not Trump creating that. You guys didn't dispute it, and you said it was leaked all over the place. Multiple people were reporting it before Trump made that expectation, so you can't blame him for that. And uh, of course his lawyers are going to be demanding action on this thing because it's insane. In fact, many Democrats are also calling it insane. In New York, the district, maybe not insane, but they're questioning it. They're saying, is this our best case to bring here? Van Jones said this was a sobering moment for Alvin. In New York, the district attorney, they say, is a constitutional officer. We have responsibilities to do all of these things. As articulated below, more meaningless stuff. We offer meetings and we have rules under the law to prohibit public disclosure, so we can't talk about any of this stuff. These confidentiality provisions exist to protect the process. We do these things fairly and independently. It's just a useless letter. It's useless. With regard to these pending investigations, Congress seems generally to have been respectful They say that these letters are an unlawful incursion into New York's sovereignty. So he's flexing back a little bit. This is probably what they were doing yesterday is what I was saying. I don't think that, you know, they canceled their letter. So they, the, the, the grand jury proceeding so that they could get together and smash all of the New York attorneys heads together to come up with a letter like this. Congressional review usurps executive powers. And, you know, I actually agree with a lot of these on principle. I think that. I don't want the federal government coming in and, and crapping all over what we're doing in the state. But as we have seen, the weaponization of the government has gotten to such an egregious point that the J6 committee was not even legally constituted and they weaponized the whole stinking government against 1-6, which was the domestic 9-11, to then lay this blanket of domestic security over all of us and smother us all into oblivion. 
this case should never be brought. The Congress is doing the same thing that the J6 committee did, and they're investigating what they think is appropriate to investigate. And so this is the new reality we live in. Unfortunately, I wish we really didn't live in this uh, current environment, but it's how it goes because we have partisan hacks who are thinking that using the levers of justice are legitimate ways of governing in the United States. It's the most insane, sane development that we've got. But that's what's happening now. And it's because of people like Mark Pomerantz and people like Kerry Dunn, former New York prosecutors who have such a vendetta against Donald Trump. They've made it basically, in my opinion, their whole basis for existence. Here is one of them. This is Mark Pomerantz on 60 Minutes, very upset after Alvin Bragg won. Mark Pomerantz resigned in protest. You're not prosecuting Donald Trump. I got to leave now. And he drafted a big resignation letter and then stormed out of there like a child. And he explained it to 60 Minutes, who elevated him because they say that this was a hero. This was a momentous moment where he, he resigned for principle. This is the type of prosecutor that was in New York, and this is the type of pressure that came down to bear upon Alvin Bragg. That's why he got cold feet. He wasn't going to prosecute. All of these people left, and Alvin said, uh-oh, I'm not going to get invited to the cocktail parties anymore. I better change course. If you take the exact same conduct uh, and make it not about Donald Trump and not about a former president of the United States, would the case have been indicted? It would have been indicted in a flat second. No, it wouldn't have. You said in your resignation letter. No, it wouldn't have. It was already rejected by a bunch of people. That um, Bragg's decision amounted to a, a grave failure of justice. Yeah. You still believe that? Yes. I still believe it. Yeah. But don't prosecutors often disagree with decisions made by their bosses? I mean, what, what makes this different? Trump. Given all the evidence that we had. Trump. And that nobody said, hey, the guy's not guilty. Nobody said that. Nobody ever said that. Mark Pomerantz, who spent one year examining the former president's annual financial statements and accounting documents from 2011 to 2020, said everyone on his team concluded Donald Trump had lied about his assets to appear wealthier than he was to obtain multi-million dollar favorable bank loans to... Yeah, that was the other case where they actually... He, Trump never was involved in that, right? They took that over and they dealt with that with Alan Weisselberg. Here's another one was that the financial statements that were submitted to banks for those years were uh, overstated in each case by literally billions of dollars. Billions. Billions of dollars. How was his business empire uh, dependent on... Statements that he prepared uh, were given to the banks and had to be given to the banks in order to get the loans that he got. So he got hundreds of millions of dollars of bank financing in connection with many of his properties. But it sounds like you're saying that his empire is built on lies. His empire was built on lies. Wow, these two, great discussion, very dramatic reading, yeah, built on lies. Has nothing to do with the fact that, they're, that he's Donald Trump, you know. These people don't uh, wake up every morning in a cold sweat thinking about him because of the crimes, because of the uh, bad loans. No, they're searching for some reason to smash him back down because that's just who they are. Now, we've got some other interesting letters that got filed or sent over by Congress to these people. Let's take a quick look at one of them. They're going to be more or less the same because I think they're going to two prosecutors who are both part of the office. Here's what it says. From Jim Jordan, chairman on the Judiciary Committee out of the House of Representatives, this letter drafted March 22nd sent over to Mark Pomerantz, the guy we just heard from. He was a former prosecutor, no longer there. Now he's over at the Free and Fair Litigation Group. The Congress sends this letter, they say to him. Hey, Mark. Apparently, Alvin Bragg, your former boss, is about to engage in an unprecedented abuse of prosecutorial authority. The indictment of a former president of the United States and a declared candidate for that office. This indictment comes after years of the DA's office when you were over there pursuing charges, including by appointing you 
as an unpaid special assistant district attorney to lead the investigation into every facet of President Trump's finances. Last year, you resigned from the office over Bragg's initial reluctance to move forward with the charges, and you shamed Bragg in your resignation letter like a crybaby, which was subsequently leaked. And then suddenly, what happens? Alvin changes his mind and starts wanting to bring charges. So based on your unique role, Mark, in this matter, and your subsequent public statements prejudicing the impartiality of any prosecution, like we just heard, he's, he's angry. And, why, why are you so mad about Donald Trump? What did he do to you? Where did he touch you? Show us on the doll. We request your cooperation with our oversight of this politically motivated prosecutorial decision. He's so fired up about it that he was unpaid. He's like, I'm going to go dedicate my life to taking this dude down. With, without any payment. The New York County District Attorney Office has been investigating Trump since at least 2018, weirdos, looking for some legal theory on which to bring charges. Wouldn't you be embarrassed with yourself if you worked on a project for four years and it turned into nothing? The, the facts surrounding the, like this, you know, this is not a complicated thing. The facts surrounding the impending indictment have been known for years, exactly. Michael Cohen, President Trump's former disgraced lawyer, pleaded guilty over four years ago to charges based on the same facts at issue in this indictment. <laughs> and he's as biased as you guys are. By July 2019, however, federal prosecutors already looked at this and they determined that no additional people would be charged alongside with Cohen. In January 2022, soon after Bragg took office, he expressed doubts about President Trump's case, and he suspended the investigation. And that's when guys like you, Mark Pomerantz, and Kerry Dunney, you guys threw a temper tantrum and you resigned. You penned a scathing resignation letter in which you baselessly accused President Trump of, quote, numerous felony violations. And you asserted it would be a grave failure of justice if Bragg did not pursue the charges. You urged Bragg to hold President Trump, quote, fully accountable for his crimes, like a scorned prosecutor. Weird. Asserting that Bragg's decision will doom any future prospects for prosecution. <laughs> Their whole lives are over. I think we read that letter here. I have to look it up, but very dramatic. Your resignation letter found its way to the New York Times. I wonder how that happened. Found its way. Yeah. Yeah. Word for word, and your criticisms of Bragg's investigation were widely reported by the news outlets. Your unrelenting pursuit of Trump followed you into the private sector as you and Dunn, Dunny, the other guy, formed your own law firm, quote, weighing ways to bar Trump from holding future office. So I see what happened here. These guys are getting into the lawfare game. They want to be like, you know, little Mark Elias or something out there. They're like, yeah, we can go do this too. We're going to go be pals with Mark and they're going to start like their democracy docket sister-in-law. And you see here, oh, what is it called? Oh, the free and fair litigation group. Oh, that's really great. Nice job, guys. So they're going to go up against the democracy docket. Republicans better figure this stuff out, man. And there is big money being funneled into this. They formed literally a law firm dedicated to weighing ways to bar President Trump from holding office. Where are the Republican law firms that are dedicated? How many, how many hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars are being pumped into these organizations to go and just sit around all day and just weigh out ways and strategize to take out Trump? It's crazy. Just this month, you published a book excoriating Bragg. It's his life's work now for not aggressively prosecuting Trump, laying bare the office's internal deliberations about the investigation and your personal animus towards Trump. It now appears that your efforts to shame Bragg have worked as he's reportedly resurrecting a so-called zombie case against Trump using a tenuous and untested legal theory. Even the Washington Post quoted legal expert as calling Bragg's actions unusual, and that's from the Washington Post, and prosecutors have repeatedly examined the long-established details but decided not to pursue charges. In addition, your loser star witness, Michael Cohen, has serious credibility problems as a convicted perjurer and a serial fabricator with demonstrable pre prejudice against Trump. Comparable to yours. Under these circumstances, there is no scenario in which Cohen could fairly be considered unbiased and credible. The interference and the inference from the totality of these facts is that Bragg's impending indictment is motivated by political calculations. 
The facts of this matter have not changed, not since 2018, and no new witnesses have emerged, no new evidence. The Justice Department already examined these facts in 2019, opted not to prosecute. But even still, according to reports, the investigation gained momentum this year after Bragg's office convened a new grand jury. The only intervening factor, the only thing that changed, President Trump announced he's running for president. You're kidding. Weird. So they say your actions, Alvin, both as a special prosecutor and since leaving the office. Uh, I'm sorry. This is not to Alvin. This is to Mark. Your actions, Mark, as the special prosecutor, cast serious doubts on the administration of justice in a fair and impartial manner. Your words in the New York Times have unfairly disparaged President Trump, an innocent and uncharged man, by the way. And we often forget about that, about the presumption of innocence in this country a very important concept to Western ideals and democracy in this world that often gets dumped on because the left doesn't like somebody. As a felon, you said that was a felon to millions of Times readers. Your book, again, unfairly disparaged him, now opens the door to examination about the DA's office commitment to even-handed justice. So in light of this unprecedented and overzealous partisan investigation, Mark, Congress has a keen interest in these facts to inform potential legislation to improve the functioning and the fairness of our justice system and to better delineate prosecutorial authority between feds and local officials. In addition, because this might come from Mueller's investigation, we also might consider some things there. And so accordingly, Mark, here's what we want from you. All of your communications from your time at the DA's office, all communications about President Trump, all documents relating to your role as the special assistant, and we want your testimony. And we'd like to have you over for a transcribed interview and some tea. This letter is a formal request to preserve all existing future and re existing records. Oh, I love that. I love me a good preservation sentence. Anytime we can shove a preservation sentence in there, I love it. Hey, Mark, by the way, don't delete anything, just in case we might need that. We'll be around. You should construe this preservation notice as an instruction to take all reasonable steps to not destroy or alter anything, or else you're in big trouble, buddy boy, including your text messages, which is just whew, outstanding, because we know that Fishing Benny Thompson, Crying Adam Kinzinger, Liz Cheney, they all were sending letters out hand over fist like they were just at a typewriter just all night, just sending letters out. Sean Hannity, Sebastian Gorka, a bunch of people on Twitter got them and they wanted everything. They said, preserve it, preserve it, preserve it. The Republicans are doing it too. Sincerely, your friend, Chairman Jim Jordan. Perfect. Love it. All right. So that's good news. So that was one letter that went over to Pomerantz. Carrie Dunn got a very similar letter Let's just take a quick look at it. I'm going to guess it's almost a copy and paste. Probably the same questions, more or less. So both of those, yeah, it is. It, it's actually even shorter. So, and they're talking a lot about Pomerantz. All right, so we'll leave that one there, but you can see. Apparently, these two guys both got a law firm together. I mean, worked together, became partners in, in formula, or work at a law firm, and a big part of what they're intending to do is weigh the ways to stop Trump, according to the letter. So very fun. We'll see if there's other letters to get fired back or what these attorneys decide to do. We'll continue to follow that. But there is more because even though it feels like the New York Manhattan investigation into Trump is sort of stalling out, petering out with a whimper, there is a lot more going on in the special counsel's office. Politico reports that Trump and Mike Pence are urging a judge to reject a bid to get Pence's testimony. You remember this guy, Mike, Jack Smith, is trying to get Mike Pence to come and testify. Attorneys for Trump and Mike Pence, they were both in federal court today outside of New York to fight efforts against Jack Smith. He wants to subpoena Mike Pence as part of the 2020 election investigation. Four Trump lawyers were there. Evan Corcoran, Jim Trustee, John Rowley, and Tim Parlatori. Pence lawyers were there. They all want to stop this subpoena. They don't want Mike Pence to testify. Special counsel wants Pence's testimony. 
about the weeks and months preceding the J6 attack, saying that rioters loyal to Trump forced Pence to flee and they want his testimony to weigh in. Article says that it's an early test for District Judge James Boisberg. Took the gavel last week after his predecessor expired. Term expired, not the predecessor. The chief judge is tasked with overseeing all grand jury matters. Pence's fight to block the subpoena is not the only way the inquiry could have far-reaching constitutional consequences. A three-judge court of appeals panel is going to rule on a separate issue. So, as you can see, a lot of stuff going on. And we'll keep our eye on that. But that was today. We don't know what the outcome of that was from Politico, but a lot of stuff going on. Also, a jury investigation, uh, uh, an investigation in Georgia taking place as well. About the only person who's not under federal investigation or the subject of subpoenas or the subject of transcribed interviews, well, there was one we read through here, is Ray Epps. Ray Epps continues to somehow escape any criminality. It's very curious. But he is feeling full of energy, full of bravado. He says, you know what? It's time I clear my name. Yes, I may have been the guy who was screaming into the Capitol, into the Capitol. He may have been there at the first breach. He may have been whispering into people's ears. He may have walked onto the Capitol property and all of these other things, including being there the night before and uh, other sorts of violent activity, like pushing flags into people and other things. But he's just roaming around free and he's feeling so good, so full of gusto that he's in fact demanding that Tucker Carlson issue a retraction. Here's what Ray Epps says, according to the New York Times. The man at the center of the conspiracy theory, what, what, what are you talking about? Demands a retraction from Fox. First of all, they should have used his name. We all know who he is now. A lawyer for Ray Epps has demanded that Tucker publicly apologize for false and defamatory statements, calling him a federal agent during the Capitol attack. Well, we've called him a fed, but when we say fed, it's this loose term, you know, it sort of means that maybe he's not on the federal payroll, but it means that maybe he was a confidential human source or he was working with them. He didn't get charged after all. And people who were standing right next to him did. Ray Epps was on the FBI's most wanted list. And then he wasn't all of a sudden. Why is that? So they're calling it a conspiracy theory. I don't know what the, what the conspiracy is. That, that, that I guess he's a paid federal informant. I don't think anybody's actually claiming that. But they sent a letter on Thursday. They said, Tucker, you're a bad person. We want a formal on-air apology for the lies that have been spread about Mr. Epps. They say the fanciful notions that Carlson advances on his show regarding Epps' involvement are demonstrably and already proven to be false. Letters are seeking retractions and, and apologies. They're preparing a defamation lawsuit. Mr. Epps' demands comes as Mr. Carlson and other top figures at Fox already under pressure from a $1.6 billion lawsuit. In a series of recent filings, Mr. Epps traveled to Washington and was videotaped urging people to go inside the Capitol. Yeah, that's true. There's no conspiracy about that. It's on video. He was also in the crowd moving past the barricades outside the building. That's what we're talking about, too. Still, he became the face of a conspiracy theory. He showed up on the FBI's most wanted list. He was on, I think he was like number 16. He was one of the first ones, one of the first ones through the breach. But then they go, oh crap, that's one of ours. Delete that. The FBI agents with their coloring book, they opened up their Microsoft paint and they got the eraser. Oh, I could have Ray Epps there. So Mr. Carlson apparently featured Epps on his show and we'll see what happens. Now, I'm excited to see what Tucker Carlson does with this. Hopefully he addresses it tonight. But that's about the only person who's not getting indicted. Of course, we'll continue to cover all of that. Trump, we'll see if there's anything new tomorrow on Friday, but it doesn't look like there will be. It may not happen until next week. If we even get an indictment, then we'll have to wait and see. But of course, we will continue to cover it.